In this video, we are going to take a very high level look at memory technology. The primary purpose here is because we want to understand the influence this has on the performance on, of a processor. And in turn, this leads to the motivation for using cache memory. So this is a structure of a basic SRAM or static random access memory cell. As you can see on the left hand side, it essentially consists of six transistors. We are not going to go into the details of how exactly this works. And we don't really want to understand how CMOS transistors work for the purpose of our discussion right now. A slightly more high level diagram is what you see on the right hand side. The main thing to keep in mind over here is that the storage itself happens within two back to back inverters, that is not gates. We also have something marked as WL, which is a word line or a word select line, and two lines marked BL and BL bar, which are basically the bit line and the complement of the bit line. This structure is what is used in order to store and retrieve data corresponding to one bit. And the part marked with the blue boundary is typically called one SRAM cell. Now, what do we do with such SRAM cells? We need to create a larger memory structure, a rough outline of which is shown in the figure here. What you can see is that there are many small rectangular black cells, each of which corresponds to one of the six transistor SRAM cells that we saw in the previous slide. For each of those cells, there is a line B and B bar. And the numbers that you see there, B n minus one, B n minus two up to B zero, correspond to the different bit locations in a word. So if our memory is a 32 bit wide memory, it would mean that n would be equal to 32 and we would have bit lines from B31 down to B0 and the corresponding complement lines B31 bar down to B0 bar. So clearly these bit lines form some kind of columns where the cells are placed. And as you can imagine, the word lines are used in order to select one row out of the column. So let's say that some the kth row is being selected and WLK is made equal to one and all the other word lines are left at their default value of zero. Then as we can see from the structure of the basic SRAM cell, the word line being equal to one will turn on the two transistors M5 and M6 which are essentially known as access transistors. And this in turn will mean that the bit line and bit line bar wires will get either pulled down to zero or pulled up depending on the content of the data at Q and Q bar. Typically the way that this SRAM block operates is that the bit line and the bit line bar are pre-charged to a high voltage value. So then when we turn on the WL, what will happen is it will cause the side corresponding to zero, which is either Q or Q bar, to pull down the corresponding line, BL or BL bar, a little bit down towards zero. The reason I say a little bit is because typically the bit line and bit line bar wires are long wires that are connected to many such transistors and therefore have a very large capacitance. It's not easy to pull the voltages down there very rapidly. What is done instead is the blue block shown at the bottom of the figure marked as sense amplifiers can then detect any differences in voltage between the bit line and the bit line bar and amplify that to convert that into an actual bit value. So this is sort of the very, very high level lightning overview of what a basic SRAM structure looks like. The main takeaways that you need to keep in mind over here are the fact that there is a concept of word lines which allow us to select a specific word to be read out. And there are these bit lines which are connected to a large number of SRAM cells. And as a result, they will be the ones that finally allow us to read out the values that are stored inside the memory. A similar arrangement is also used in order to write values back into the memory. We are not going to go into that because that will take us way out of scope of what we want to discuss right now. So what would a large memory bank implemented using such cells look like? Imagine that I'm trying to implement a one kilobyte memory. 
what we will have is 1k locations and each location stores 8 bits. The figure drawn in the middle, the long rectangle, essentially shows what this would actually look like. And as you can see, this has a very skewed aspect ratio. What I mean by aspect ratio is the ratio of the height to the width. The reason is simply that we have 1k locations. If I have 10 address bits, it means that I can address 2 to the power of 10 locations. And therefore, I have 1k locations in my SRAM. But each of those locations only stores 8 bits. In other words, when you try to actually lay this out on silicon, you will find that the structure that you end up with is very tall but narrow. This is not really a good way of designing circuits because it becomes difficult to manage the wiring lengths and the delays across the various parts of the circuit. What is typically done instead is to do some kind of folding of the circuit. And this is a simple way by which it might be done. The same 1K locations could be broken up into two parts. We have the 128 rows that are selected by the top seven bits of the address. And the data itself is arranged into eight different columns. The top seven bits of the address are going to select the eight columns corresponding to one of the 128 locations. And the bottom three bits of the address will be used for a column select. That is, they will be applied to a further multiplexer, which will result in actually selecting the final eight bits that need to be pulled out. This gives a much better aspect ratio. As you can see, it's roughly 128 divided by 64, the number of bits along the horizontal axis, which is much closer to a square and therefore much easier to sort of put onto silicon. Why do we need to know all this? The primary reason is so that we can understand the factors that influence the access time or the time required to pull one piece of data out of a memory block like this. As you can see, there are the bit lines that are connected to a very large number of different SRAM cells. This means that it will typically have a very large capacitance, large of course being relative, but it is large compared to the transistors that are actually trying to drive it. We also have some opposing requirements over here. We want the transistors and the SRAM cells to be as small as possible so that we can pack more of them into a given silicon area. But small transistors cannot drive large currents. So we would like to also have some transistors with large sizes so that they can drive large currents and therefore lead to faster switching. And as a result of all of this, what is typically done is that in actually creating SRAM structures, pipelining registers are also added. This pipeline register is not exactly the same as the pipeline used in a CPU. It essentially refers to the fact that you can add a one cycle delay before generating the output of the memory without really changing the functionality. The purpose of adding the pipeline register is to break the critical path, thereby resulting in better throughput. Now, as we can see, the density of SRAM cells is ultimately going to be determined by the sizes of the individual transistors. An SRAM cell ultimately consists of six transistors, the way that we have shown it. There are other cells that contain only four transistors. However, these require resistors. So they end up having similar kinds of area requirements. Can we really do better than this? That is an important question because ultimately we would like to have large amounts of memory for our CPU to work with. And the answer is that as far as SRAM is concerned, there are limitations on what we can do. We can't really do much better than what has been shown over here. The alternative is a mechanism called dynamic RAM. The transistor diagram on the right shows roughly how this works. What ends up happening is that we have this block known as a trench capacitor, which is essentially a specific technology dependent way of creating capacitances, which has a large capacitance, but occupies very little area on the surface. The way that this is done is to dig a deep trench into the silicon substrate so that the area of the capacitor is made up both in, uh, mainly in terms of the depth of the substrate rather than in the surface area occupied by it. This allows us to pack many more capacitors into the same area that would be occupied by a given SRAM cell. On top of that, as you can see, 
the readout circuitry has also been simplified. We simply have one transistor for access control. Whenever the word line is made high, it would cause the bit line to either remain at a high value or to discharge as depending on the value that is stored inside the trench capacitor. Conversely, similar kinds of circuitry can also be used in order to write values into the trench capacitor. Of course, what I have shown here is a grossly oversimplified version. The actual circuitry would be more complicated, but this gives a broad outline of what is happening. One major issue with this kind of structure is the fact that capacitors and transistors left to themselves like this, without any active power supply to maintain the voltage on the capacitor, will leak. Even though a transistor in an ideal situation is just a switch, in practice, it actually has some resistance, even though that resistance may be high, which means that the charge stored on the capacitor will eventually start leaking away and if left for long enough, could just leak away all the way to zero. In particular, it could leak sufficiently to change the value that is read out the next time we look at it. And that is not something that we would want to have. The way that dynamic RAM gets around this is that the entire memory controller circuitry is built around the notion of having refresh cycles. That is, there is a memory controller whose job is to periodically refresh every single bit that is present inside the memory block. It does this irrespective of what is actually happening in the rest of the circuit. And what it would mean is that the memory controller actually needs to take over and make sure that if a refresh cycle is going on, it will actually stall the read request until the refresh cycle is complete, then read out the value that is re uh, desired and give it back to the requester, typically the processor that is trying to read it. So in this way, dynamic RAM clearly allows us to pack a lot more density into a given area, but it has some disadvantages. It has a more complex surrounding circuitry, and it also requires specific technology in order to build the trench capacitors. One thing that you might notice in both of these cases, SRAM as well as DRAM, is that they are volatile. In other words, if you switch off the power, the contents will be lost. Not only that, the DRAM also requires constant refresh cycles at regular intervals to make sure that there is not enough time for the data present there to actually leak out. The alternative is so-called non-volatile memory, and there are many different technologies that have evolved for this. The most well-known, the popular one, is what is usually known as flash memory. Flash memory allows us to both write as well as read back the data. The main problem that you will encounter as well as flash memory is concerned is going to be the latency. It typically requires much more time in order to read or write a given value than the SRAM or the DRAM. There are other technologies that compete, for example, phase change memories, magnetic memories, and so on. And some of them actually have very interesting properties to the point where they almost have the similar lead, read latencies as SRAMs. And densities that are comparable to SRAMs or possibly even better. But those technologies are not yet available on large scale production. Perhaps as and when they do come in, they could actually change the way we design computers. What about disk? What we mean by disk is typically magnetic storage that is done on external spl spinning platters. The structure of disks is fairly complex. What we have is plates corresponding to some kind of magnetizable material and there are the read write heads that move over those plates and are responsible for actually reading or writing the data that is present at different locations of that magnetic plate. Nowadays, of course, increasingly we come across so-called SSDs, solid state drives, which are essentially based on flash technology. In both of these cases, the main purpose, what we are trying to do is to come up with some kind of large scale storage, which is non-volatile, and whether we are talking about magnetic disk or other kinds of storage or possibly even tape or flash memory, ultimately the best way to think about it is all of these form another form of storage. And we need to understand what the trade-offs are. In particular, how fast can we get data out of this given storage and how much data can we store into a given area? So this table shows 
roughly the trade-offs that are involved in different kinds of memory technologies. This is roughly from the 2012 or so time frame. The basic structure of memory has not changed too much in the intervening time. There have been some advancements in terms of how the memory is organized. And as I said, there are also certain new technologies on the horizon. But primarily at this point in time, we still largely have these different forms of memory that compete in the structure of modern computers. So as you can see over here, SRAM semiconductor memory has very fast access times. If you want to go for gigahertz speeds, that is to say cycle times in the one nanosecond range, you typically are pretty much bound to have SRAM memory for that last stage of access. However, the cost is pretty large. A gigabyte of SRAM, for example, could end up costing more than your processor. DRAM has a trade-off. The access times are typically in the tens of nanoseconds. And one of the problems, of course, with DRAM is not just the access time, but also the fact that you need to have refresh cycles. The cost per gigabyte, on the other hand, is pretty low. Flash memory, once again, is slower than DRAM, but also ends up being cheaper than DRAM, simply because it can be manufactured in bulk. And magnetic disk, of course, is the cheapest, but on the other hand, is so slow that we are actually talking about multiple orders of magnitude. There are two metrics that are of primary interest to us when we consider storage technologies. The first is the latency, which could also be called the time to first byte. As we saw in the previous table, the latency is essentially what is captured in the first column. And SRAM is clearly much faster. As far as disks are concerned, a simple calculation shows us why things are so slow. Typical disks today would be operating at something like 5,400 RPM, possibly faster. They may even go up to 15,000 RPM for the fastest disks that exist. Now, imagine that the head is at a sp specific spot on the disk, and the data that you want is half a rotation away. And the time required in order to rotate through half a cycle, even though we are spinning at a fairly high rate, is something on the order of milliseconds. Now, one millisecond on a one gigahertz processor is one million clock cycles. So clearly, this is not something desirable. It's not something we would want to have. SRAM, on the other hand, can actually have single cycle access even for a processor running in the gigahertz range. Pretty much any other memory technology is going to require multiple clock cycles to respond to a processor so in other words, if you have a load request, you would definitely need more than one clock cycle for the data to come back, even from DRAM. The other metric that we are interested in is what's called the throughput, which is basically the number of bytes per second. In other words, even if it takes quite some time in order to get the first byte out, it might be possible to thereafter read a large number of values in a burst. For example, on the disk, you can imagine that once we have reached the correct location, we might be able to read much more than one byte every millisecond, right? which is the number that you would think if you assume that each byte has to be individually accessed and read out. Given the fact that we are rotating at 5,400 RPM, it would then be determined by the density with which data is stored on the disk and not just on the size of the disk. The number of bytes per second typically ends up being limited by other factors, which is how we can get the data into the system also. The SATA, the serial ATA, which is the technology typically used in order to interface external disks or even internal disks to a computer, has a speed of six gigabits per second. Note that it's bits, six gigabits per second. On the other hand, the solid state drives that are typically interfaced directly to a PCI Express interface inside a system can achieve about four gigabytes per second. This is six to 10 times more than what a SATA disk can manage. Raw DRAM, on the other hand, can manage throughput of up to 100 gigabytes per second or so. Ultimately, this is determined by the structure that has been created inside the CPU in order to interface to the external RAM. It depends on the clock speed that we are using and the number of bits that can be loaded in parallel from the DRAM into the CPU. So if I'm running at a one gigahertz clock speed, 
and I have a 128-bit bus that connects me to DRAM, then even though the initial access latency of the DRAM might be high, I can get a 128 gigabits per second into the system. If I have multiple such lanes connecting to a single processor, I would be able to get giga, hundreds of gigabytes per second. Now, as you can imagine, in order to actually get all of this done, you will typically need hundreds of pins on the package of the CPU. And in fact, if you look at modern CPUs, at least the high-end CPUs, you typically find that they have on the order of close to a thousand pins or so. Quite a few of those are used just for the voltage supply and the ground, but a very large number of them are then used for transferring memory, transferring data from the memory into the CPU. The latest developments on this front are what is called HBM or high bandwidth memory. And the second iteration of this high bandwidth memory version two supports up to 256 gigabytes per second per package. As you can imagine, this would require a fairly large number of pins. The other way that this is done is not necessarily to have a large number of pins, but to actually use serializer, deserializer circuitry in order to actually transfer data on a single serial link at much higher than the one gigabit per second that would be determined by the clock rate of the system. So to summarize, there are many different memory technologies that can be used inside processors. They have trade-offs, the primary trade-off being the speed with which a given data can be accessed versus how much data can be packed into a given area or cost. As a result of this, we need to make engineering decisions in order to balance speed versus cost of the entire system. And this is where the concept of caches comes into the picture. 